age, so to speak. What we're, what we're debating here is a worldview issue. Oh. It's, a, it's not about the evidence. It's about how the evidence should be interpreted. Okay. And the only way to refute a worldview is with a reductio ad absurdum. You assume the worldview and show that it leads to an inconsistency. Okay. And so the best way to disprove, to show it, see, I don't think there is any evidence for an old universe. And we can talk about that. But I would say that what I do when I present evidence for a young universe, I assume for the sake of argument, uniformitarianism, I'll give you naturalism, that the universe came in, you know, it, it just, there's no God, everything happens at constant rates and so on. And you still end up with, in many cases, uh, ages that are much younger than the secular time scale would allow. Mm -hmm. Now, the secularist, if he's, if he's going to argue properly, he should assume catastrophism and supernatural creation and then argue that under those conditions, nonetheless, there are some instances where you still get millions of years. But the problem is that I, I'm not aware of any case where that happens. In other words, all the arguments that are for the millions or billions of years assume to some extent uniformitarianism and to some extent naturalism, things that I would reject, you see. And so it begs the question because they're assuming their own worldview and then arguing that that demonstrates that my worldview is wrong, but they've already assumed that at the outset. Does, does that make sense? Yes, yes. Okay. At this point, the main thing I wanted to point out is the nature of the arguments that we make from science to confirm a young universe. And, and those are almost always via the reductio ad absurdum, where we assume for the sake of hypothesis the uniformitarian standards and then show that even when we assume those standards, there are many situations where you get an age estimate that is much, much younger than the billions of years. In fact, you usually do. There are very few methods, even assuming uniformitarianism and naturalism, there are very few methods that give the answers of billions of years that the secularists need in order to accommodate evolution. Not that that really would, but that's what they think they need anyway. So one of the things that I was trying to point out here is that somebody who were to argue against my position, the only way they could rationally do it is to assume supernatural creation, uh, cat uh, catastrophism, namely the worldwide flood, and then show that that leads to an inconsistency. But the problem is it doesn't lead to an inconsistency. When you assume the straightforward reading of the Bible, uh, literal days of Genesis, supernatural creation, global flood, and then you take a look at the science, it's very consistent with that. And we'll see in, in Hugh Ross's response that he doesn't do the reductio ad absurdum. He's assuming his own presuppositions and then trying to argue that they're consistent in some cases. Well, I don't deny that, but that doesn't prove anything. The fact is, you can assume those secular presuppositions and in many cases get an answer that is absurd, that is incompatible with those very presuppositions. And therefore, that is a refutation of the deep time argument in terms of the science behind it. And again, it can be difficult to explain these concepts in the, in the short time span that you have for a, a dialogue like this. I, I tried to keep that as, that as succinct as possible, but uh, my, my point is that any uh, allegedly scientific argument I've ever heard for deep time begs the question, everyone, because they all assume to some extent naturalism and uniformitarianism, which the consistent biblical creationist rejects because they're contrary to scripture. Let's, let's take the secular time scale, the billions of years, and make their assumptions, their uniformitarian sta standards, and show that it leads to an inconsistency. So that's what we in logic call a reductio ad absurdum. It's refuting a worldview by assuming it and showing that it leads to an inconsistency. Take carbon dating, for example. Uh, C14 has a half-life of 5,700 years. And uh, it turns out if you had the entire Earth uh, made up of nothing but C14, with that short a half-life, in one million years, you'd not have a single atom left. All, it would all have disintegrated into, uh, uh, into nitrogen. Now, if, if there's no new source of C14. Now, it's produced in the upper atmosphere as cosmic rays bombard nitrogen atoms, converts them into C14. And uh, plants absorb it because they take in the carbon dioxide. And then we eat the plants or animals eat the plants. And we eat the animals. Either way, we get new carbon in us. That's where we get our carbon from. And a small fraction of that is C14. Uh, so it's just, uh, it's like one in a trillion. It's a very small fraction, which is, which is good because we don't want to be glowing or anything like that. So uh, you're, you're, you're all unstable. <laughs> I like to tell people that a little bit. You're all a little bit unstable. Uh, and the rate at which that decays if something were buried deep in the earth and it were millions of years old, it shouldn't have any C14 left in it because C14 is produced in the upper atmosphere. You, you can't really get it into fossils, things like that, that are buried deep down that are shielded from cosmic rays. You can get a little bit from radioactivity, but not very much. And so the fact that we, when we dig up things, when we dig up fossils, and if we carbon date them, 
lo and behold, you're going to get ages that are consistent with the biblical time scale. Maybe not exactly the same, because again, the point is not to get the true age. The point is to show an inconsistency in the, the secular, the, the deep time, time so, scale. 